I know, I know. <clears throat> it's been a while. Hundred percent my fault. But the big homie is back. Boom. Welcome back to the ballot and the bullet. The ballot and the bullet. Yes, we talked about that title uh, in the first episode. Yes, the ballot and the bullet is still relevant. Brother Malcolm coined the ballot or the bullet back in 63, 64, I believe. But now we're saying the ballot and the bullet. Welcome back to the channel. Um, if you haven't already, please do subscribe. You know, tell your friends, tell your family. This is the station where it's everything uh, practical and progressive, right? In terms of your politics and in terms of your protection. Right, it's practical and it's progressive in terms of your protection and your politics. Right, and so we, we're going to have a balance, right? We're going to bounce around um, between talking about politics, right? And we're going to have some gun reviews or, or some topics in which, you know, we talk about firearms. Um, my newest baby here is my MCK for my. CZP10F, CZP10F, and so yeah, we'll, we'll, we're gonna have a little review on that coming out very, very shortly. I promise you. Now let's jump right into this review. Now let's jump right into. Finally. So you saw the topic, right? What do, what's the black perspective on the war in Ukraine? The war on Ukraine. What do black people think about the war in Ukraine? Is there a black perspective or is there always a uniform or a singular American perspective? No, right? <laughs> The answer is absolutely because of the, the the special history that black folks have in terms of the relationship we have with the United States of America, we absolutely have a unique perspective. Um, and so, again, let's let's just jump this off with the obvious. The black voice is not monolithic, right? And in no way am I saying I'm speaking for all black people, right? We know the black voice isn't monolithic. Blacks exist on a spectrum, a political spectrum, just like everyone else, right? Even though, you know, we tend to be, you know, center left in, in, in the Democratic Party, the party of uh, stagnation. Um, again, I don't presume to speak for all black people, right? But what I, what I will tell you is if you speak to enough black people, um, what you'll hear is these common trends um, around, around the war. So let's jump right into it. Again, we're going to come at this from two perspectives, right? I mean, there's many angles that we can approach this war, um, but we're going to look at it from two perspectives primarily. The first one is intervention, right, in general, right? And where do we see intervention being appropriate? And then the second and where we're going to close is in talking about hum humanitarian crises um, and refugee crises um, across the globe. Um, in Ukraine, but across the globe um, also. So let's jump into intervention, right? Let's be clear. The U.S. is intervening in the war on Ukraine in so many ways, right? In a thousand different ways, we're seeing U.S. intervention, right? We're seeing, whether approved or not, weapons, money, expert level training. Um, you know, if those things aren't there already, they're on their way. Um, the U.S. is allowing through many channels, front channels and back channels, allowing expatriates, private citizens, and private paramilitary groups, ugh, Blackwater, ugh, to travel to the Ukraine to assist in the fighting, right? Uh, some believe in freedom and some believe in cash. Um, some believe that the U.S. Special Forces, along with Ukrainian forces, are helping 
to protect Zelensky. Is that true? It's it's not hard to believe. It's not hard to believe at all. Um, there's so many different uh, special forces in the United States. You got the, I think it's the Army Beret. You got the Marine Corps. You got the Navy SEALs, et cetera, et cetera. In this case, though, I think it's one of those off the grid, you know, off the books, you know, badass Delta squad force, Delta squad forces, <laughs> excuse me. Um, you know, these guys are highly trained, highly rogue at times, um, at times, you know, answer to maybe one person. Um, sometimes they don't answer to anyone, right. In terms of carrying out missions. And so again, and, and thinking about intervention and, and, and being, you know, the, the freedom loving humanitarian American, uh, that I am. There's some other ideals that I also believe in, right, in terms of uh, self-determination and the right to self-preservation, right, self-protection. Um, I try to apply these equally um, to any situation, right? I'm not perfect, um, but I try to apply this fairly across all walks of life. And I think it's fair um, that when we look at America herself, we say, okay, what are your ideals? What are, what are the things that you put forth? Um, what are your truths, beliefs, and America has done a great job at promoting these things, but hasn't done a great job at holding itself accountable to them, both internally, uh, domestically, as well as abroad, right? Um, you know, if you look at American history, we've had to, we as black people and other folks who uh, needed to defend their rights and stand up for their rights uh, pushed for so many uh, bills, acts, uh, amendments to the Constitution, right? If you think about the 13th, 14th, and 15th amendments to the Constitution and how critical uh, they were. So when I think about intervention, you know, I think about, you know, what does intervention mean and what is it used for, right? What's the purpose of it? And I live in Philadelphia, right? Uh, Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. And you can turn on the news, any national news, and you can see that there are issues in Philadelphia, uh, issues in Washington, D.C. Um, but if you pick up some of the small time newspapers, there's issues in these small towns as well, increases in crime. Uh, you know, in uh, Kentucky, there was just a, a school shooting where I think a 12 year old went into the school and shot another 12 year old. Uh, don't don't quote me on that, but it was something very close to that. Right. And so in terms of intervention. You know, it's hard to point the finger at other people and tell them what they should be doing. Uh, when we need to be intervening right here in the United States of America. Right. We need our federal government to intervene right here in the United States of America, right here in Los Angeles, right here in Chicago, right here in New Orleans, right here in Baton Rouge, right here in uh, Baltimore, uh, right here in Philadelphia, right? When we talk about the, the purposes of, of intervention is to mitigate excessive harm, risk, death, right? We are at war right here in Pennsylvania. We are at war right here in Pennsylvania with politicians who don't want to fund our schools. We are at war with an industrial complex, right, that pours millions into prisons and policing policies instead of parks, piercing the wealth gap, maybe. I say gap, like a canyon, right? Right here in Pennsylvania, we are at war with folks that love oil more than energy independence, right? More than energy independence. Our president is on his knees at Saudi Arabia and Venezuela begging for oil. He just tapped the, the National Reserve at uh, 1 million barrels per day for the next six months because of this energy independence. Um, 
that folks just fight because of their love for oil. We need intervention right here. When I think about uh, right here in the Philadelphia public school system, some of the numbers I would see in the newspaper in terms of the deficit, we're talking small numbers, right? We're talking, you know, $40 million, and that seems like a lot. But we're talking about educating our children, right? We're talking about a large public school district. Right. So what ultimately what's important to you in terms of intervening, intervene right here. Right here. Not too long ago, there was a, a bridge in Minnesota that collapsed. People died on that bridge. Intervene in our infrastructure. The people in Flint still got dirty water. Still, intervene right here. Right here, we had a police chief and a DA overlook the murder of a black man with the belief that a friend and convicted murderer was in fact innocent. Ridiculous. Intervene right here. I didn't approve of the president's uh, pick for attorney general because I thought we needed someone who would immediately reinstall the consent decrees on some of these police precincts and, and police departments that don't play by the rules. That stop people to increase the the tax base um for 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 their stats right we need to be really clear around what intervention means in ukraine right right now we are over one billion dollars right we go from not having any money being fiscally fiscally responsible to pulling one billion dollars out the air and sending it to another country yeah, to defend themselves. It's for a good reason, right? No doubt. I'm not saying not send the money, but I'm saying spend money here first. And we're not doing that. We're not doing that. So many school districts need emergency funds right now. I just don't understand why we can intervene and, and send... Uh, so much of our infrastructure and capacity that are on the fringes of our military, right, to Ukraine to assist. But we're having a hard time protecting our citizens. We're having a hard time educating our citizens. We're having a hard time keeping our citizens healthy. And we're having a difficult time getting off of this crack addiction to oil. You know, America talks about spreading democracy. You know, stamping out evil is one of the phrases uh, Republican Bush, too, used to utter. But what America does, and primarily the Republicans, is it vomits on democracy. She assists in overthrowing democratically elected governments, Haiti, Iran, the DR, and turn a blind eye while thugs run governments Saudi Arabia, right? Saudi Arabia, right? That's the, the, the top thuggest country. That is the top thuggest country in the world. Saudi Arabia. They do whatever the hell they want, right? They murdered Kasoji, Kasoji, whatever the guy's name was. This guy right here. They murdered him. 
Do you understand that? And they got away with it. They got away with it. No one, no one could do anything. So, what does intervention look like from a black perspective? It looks like that when we look domestically, we need more intervention, right? Domestically, we need more intervention. That's what it, it looks like from a black perspective, right? When we look internationally, what we look at is we need to see some consistency with the support of democratic forces throughout the world, but particularly on the African continent. Rwanda, zero intervention, zero. The Sudan, straight up, I think where there was melanin, there was no intervention. Right, like th that's that's where there was melanin, there was no intervention, right? And so we need the U.S. to be consistent in that regard, consistent in that regard, not sometimey, consistent in that regard. Number two, the humanitarian crisis refugee crisis this is another area in which we're t we're looking at the um, american narrative right and we're saying where is the consistency once again we'll start with the summary and it, it's where the last point ended the fact is if you were from a white nation and you are in a small amount of distress Help is on the way. Help is on the way right now as I shoot this video. And if your skin has a tad bit of melanin, you're on your own. Don't go to the UN. Don't uh don't don't lobby the 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 any anybody, the EU, anyone. No no one's coming to your rescue, right? And I, I think that that's policy, right? It's, do we see a financial gain? And do we see family or brethren, right? In which we're willing to step in, Ukraine. Um, again, I'm not knocking it. If I was the, the president of a country and and, and I, I saw a country that was uh, sort of like my cousin, would I, would I help them in terms of arms and money? Absolutely. Absolutely. But I would also not be a hypocrite. I would also try to be consistent in that regard. Consistent. Right. So when we talk about the humanitarian crises or crisis, you know, I, we, we can go back, you know, 20 years, 30 years, 50 years. But if we look at the most recent humanitarian crisis, crisis, the most recent, right, not the not the one as a result of, of Russia's devastation in, in the Ukraine. Uh, assault on Ukraine, war in Ukraine, the bludgeoning and flattening of Ukraine, right? If we go back just a little bit, the most recent refugee crisis was Syria, right? This was a region and a country that was decimated and flattened by Syrian forces, supported by Russian forces, right? It was a proxy war. The Russians and the, and the Syrians ultimately won that war, but millions fled the country, millions. I don't recall the US assisting in setting up refugee camps in neighboring countries and funding operations with US tax dollars on the scale that we're seeing today in Poland. Correct me if I'm wrong. If I'm wrong, put it in the comments. Because I don't think we saw the same level of response. There were literally nations in Europe whose policy was simply to close the border to Syrians. 
just close the border. Right? Some the, some countries knew there were uh, a million refugees, right? It, you know, some took 300. 300. Some took 50, right, in terms of these small nations. Go look it up. Ridiculous in terms of the response. Prior to that, we're talking about a continual crisis, a refugee and humanitarian crisis in Palestine. I know it's controversial, right? But this, but w regardless of what you think about this, the politics at the high level, you can't, you still have to look at the citizens and the humans and say that they, they were forced to flee their country and they, 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 they left with nothing. And these were good middle-class people just like the Ukrainians, and they did, they still are not getting the type of support while living under an apartheid-type regime in, in Israel. Like, let's be serious right now. So again, from a black perspective, we say, show us that black and brown life matters domestically and abroad that's 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 really what we want to see right and that that's our perspective right when we look at the war we see resources being poured into those into the war resources that can help our community right and we want to see that same type of response in terms of those resources spread evenly not just to countries that are your, your cousins or your neighbors, but on a global scale to say that if you care about humanity, let's be fair about humanity. Prove to us that black lives matter. Make us not have to wave a flag or wear a t-shirt by demonstrating that brown refugees matter. Again, for me to truly be American means uh, to to believe in, but to also practice freedom, justice, equality equally, right? And we need to do that abroad, and we need to do that right here domestically. Straight up, straight up. That's what Black people think about the war in Ukraine, war on Ukraine. Straight up, straight up. So. Again, you know, I, I was hoping to keep it brief, um, but in closing, I want to say, you know, power to all the non-racist people in the Ukraine, um, and maybe, just maybe, some some forces, um, some small, you know, badass group um, of assassins from Israel um, can make a visit to Russia and help end this war. Y'all know what I mean. The ballot and the bullet. It's your boy. The future's black. Holla at your boy. Beautiful lies. Don't break my heart. Tell me beautiful lies.